Welcome back to the Our View podcast, where we aim to educate, raise awareness, and change the tone of conversation about disabilities. On this episode, I sit down with my guest, Max Zadak. Max was the longtime assistant to the late R&B singer Luther Bandros. Max is also the founder of Divabetic, taking a note directly from their website, divabetic.org. Divabetic is a national 501c3 nonprofit organization and industry leader specializing in non-traditional and non-clinical diabetes education. Divabetic promotes wellness with a wow to change attitudes and to encourage prevention, early action, and education to manage diabetes and diabetes-related complications. Divabetic is a combination of the word diabetic with the letter V inserted for Vandross and invokes feelings of power and a positive attitude associated with the great divas Luther loved like Patti LaBelle. On this episode with Max, we discuss diabetes and our mutual love of the great Patti LaBelle. Let's get into this conversation with Max, Mr. Divabetic Zadak. Max, thank you for joining us today. Thank you for having me on the show. Oh, you're welcome. And uh, you and I, we recently connected um, toward the end of 2021 through our mutual friend, Tom. Tom and his family uh, are very good friends of mine. And uh, I went to college with his wife many years ago. And um, when they started dating, Tom became my friend as well. And uh, now there are three great kids, call me Uncle Al. And uh, they're just really, really great people. Uh, So shout out to Tom for connecting us and uh, making this happen. (laughs) So uh, Max, can you tell us a little bit about yourself, um, who you are, what you do, and can you uh, share with us something you like to do in your free time? (laughs) All right. Um, Well, I'm the founder of a national nonprofit called DivaBetic at divabetic.org. We specifically try to change attitudes about living with diabetes uh, or being affected with it or at risk of diabetes and promote healthier attitudes around that and try to help people learn how to prevent the complication. In my free time, uh, I'm usually lately because of what's going on with COVID, (laughs) I've been reading a lot. I, I write a lot and I love tennis and recently even picked up pickleball. So, um, up until a couple of years ago, I played a competitive indoor volleyball, but then I got injured. So I'm still struggling at times, you know, managing pain as I, I get my recovery. Uh, and I know you dealt with that too, just how, how, to, how do you deal with pain on a daily basis? So I've been trying to just stay positive through all of this. Yes, and that is uh, definitely a, a struggle that... Uh... I face, especially here living in New Jersey, and um, it's it snowed earlier uh, this week here, and uh, the cold weather really tightens everything up in my body. So today is uh, a pretty rough day as far as uh, discomfort goes in my body, but, uh, you know, pushing through, and, and I just I gave myself some extra time to just lay in bed for a minute, and, uh, you know, before I got my day started, and uh, just got it moving so uh and it's, yeah it's, no i i could relate i mean i have psoriasis yeah. and i have psoriatic arthritis and then i when that injury happened i did i do notice the change with the weather mm-hmm. yeah that definitely impacts me as well uh you know the especially the the sharp uh temperature changes i think over the weekend we were you know in the 60s or close to 60 and then it dropped to <laughs> 15 yeah. overnight <laughs> and snowed so uh that that really sharp drastic change in the weather really uh sets my body uh into a, a tight intense uh type of situation so I definitely can relate to that uh as well um, the thing I have to just mm-hmm. say to that though is that I don't know for you for me like if I push through some of it like if I really I always feel better on the other side. Like if I actually get up and do the stretches that I'm supposed to be doing, or, you know, like even today with the rain in New York, I live in New York City, I made sure I got out and moved a little bit, even though I was experiencing that discomfort. And so, you know, I I think that's just a personal choice, but I have to say, like, I uh, used to take a group fitness class before COVID hit, And that instructor was always at the end of class would say, put another one in the books. And I just love that idea that there wasn't a judgment to it. It didn't matter how hard 
or I worked or if I didn't work out that well that day, it was just the idea that I came and I did it. And I, it's just something about that has been such a positive uh, booster for me. And I keep that in my head as I go through my own personal fitness now. Absolutely. And I think um, for me, and I, I've heard other people uh, speak very similarly and saying that, you know, when your body is hurting, I think a natural response is to just lay and relax. But at the same time, when you move, like you said, you feel better on the other side of it. So to move and, and get active, I think, is uh, although difficult at times, it is uh, sometimes what our body need, uh, needs to do just to uh, work through it and get through it. And, um, you know, so I, I, again, I definitely relate to, uh, to what you said, and I like that, put another one in the books. So it's, <laughs> it's a really good one. <laughs> um, so can you tell us um, what, can, can you share with us what diabetes is and um, some current statistics of how many people uh, diabetes impacts, uh, you know, in the United States or around the world? Right now, I mean, I think there's like, um, well, 81 million people today are living with what they call pre-diabetes, which is considered the first sign that you could be leaning towards a diagnosis of type 2 diabetes. So that's like a huge statistic where they're, they, the American Diabetes Association lowered uh, what the normal quote-unquote bl uh, blood glucose range should be. And so now more people... Want, they want more people to be a little bit more hypervigilant of trying to prevent or delay a diagnosis of type 2 diabetes. I have diabetes in my family. I have a brother who's living with type 1 diabetes. I have um, my grandmother on my mother's side had type 2 diabetes. And so I think, uh, I don't know the stats on type 1 and type 2, but it, obviously it's several million people and it's becoming more and more um, predominant in our culture today. And the difference between my brother's type one diabetes versus type two diabetes is that my brother's pancreas stopped working. So right now you and I have pancreases that produce insulin when we eat carbohydrates to help us modify our blood sugars. My brother's pancreas stops, so he has to give himself insulin therapy uh, in order to keep his blood sugars in a target range. And people with type 2 diabetes have a pancreas that's not working as well as someone who, who isn't living with diabetes. So their pancreas is still working, but it might need a little help. And that help could come in the form of insulin therapy too. It could come in the form of oral medications, or it could come in the form of modified uh, lifestyle behaviors, which could help then their pancreas adjust to helping them um, um, and digest the carbohydrates. And diabetes to me is really an intolerance of carbohydrates and the need for us to be helping ourselves uh, deal with that in the healthiest way possible. And I think uh, the day-to-day -day management of uh, managing either type two or type one diabetes is, um, is difficult and it takes a lot of perseverance. And so that's what we try to focus at my organization. And, you know, we didn't get to mention this, but I started Divabetic because I worked for Luther Vandross. So I worked for, a lot of people today don't know who he was, but at his time, he was a pretty phenomenal singer, songwriter, and producer. And I was lucky enough uh, that I was working in theater when I got a call to go on tour with Luther back in 1993. And um, after that, I became his full-time assistant. He actually moved me to New York City. But it was in 2003, right before the release of Dance With My Father, that Luther suffered a stroke. And I knew he had type 2 diabetes, but I wasn't involved in any of his care. And so I always like to tell people that I thought it was a mistake that he had like 50 people um, helping him with his music. But when it came to managing his diabetes, he did it alone. And so for me, when I rushed into the hospital after that stroke, um, and the doctor in emergency told me that, came out immediately and told me that Luther's stroke could have been prevented. I didn't know what he was talking about. And uh, he, you know, and then I found out it was because of the diabetes. And in that moment, I had no connection between diabetes and stroke. And now uh, we know, I know so much more, but at the time, even the media was reporting on Luther's stroke 
and not making any connection between diabetes and stroke. And I thought that was a huge mistake, Arthur. So I just decided then and there that I was gonna tell my story and try to help people learn how to prevent a complication so they could keep their house at home. Yeah, oh, that's great. I um, <clears throat> I recently turned 40 years old, so I'm very well aware of who Luther is. <laughs> uh, you know, I can definitely remember being a child <laughs> and, and my mom uh, loving his music and, and listening to his music. And uh, he's definitely in my uh, Apple Music playlist. <laughs> so I uh, definitely am aware of who he is. And um, I think that's a very good point that you brought up that, uh, you know, that, that he was caring uh, his, for his diabetes on his own. And, you know, a lot of times it does, it takes, you know, family and friends and other people to really check in on you and make sure that you're doing the right things and eating the right things when you have, um, you know, when you have diabetes and it's really, um, you know, it's great that you have uh, created DivaBetic. And can you share with us um, a little bit more about DivaBetic, uh, especially how you created the name? I, I love that story. And, um, you know, and, and just uh, what further uh, tell us what your mission is and uh, your vision for DivaBetic. I'd love to. I think um, I just want to say, like, for me, I because I didn't I had diabetes in my family uh, at that moment of Luther's stroke. My grandmother, I knew my grandmother had diabetes, but I was so uninformed. I thought it was just a touch of sugar. No one ever told me what the reper repercussions could be if you mismanaged it. So with that regret and heavy in my heart, and you have to remember, because uh, you are a fan, like back when Luther had the stroke, there were months where we were in ICU and um, he was, you know, we didn't know what was going to happen. And all these radio stations around the country were doing prayer vigils for him and things like that. And I know a lot of people uh, who know who Luther is know that he had a very public battle with his weight. And that obviously at the time of the stroke, he was um, heavier, at a heavier point in his life. And so that made things difficult. So there's, you know, a lot of things swirling in my head. And I went to a... Um, uh, I was still working for Luther when he was in the hospital and helping be a uh, conduit between the healthcare providers and the family and also Luther. And because I was so involved in his personal life and managing everything, I was the right person to help make those things continue as we weren't sure where he was going. And so there was a Luther tribute concert in Madison Square Garden and Pat LaBelle, who was a good friend of Luther's was on stage. And in the middle of her song to Luth, you know, that she did as a tribute, I think was Power of Love, she stopped and she admitted right there on stage that she had diabetes, type two diabetes, but that diabetes didn't control her. And I looked up at stage and I just had that aha moment about just continuing the conversation, being so outspoken and vocal about diabetes and seeing how she was such so glamorous and beautiful with like the hair and the makeup and the jewelry. And I, I thought to myself, you're not a diabetic, you're a diva. And that's when diva bedic popped into my head. And when I got home from the concert, I wrote out diabetic with a black marker and then I took a pink marker and I put a V in bet between the I and the A and made it diva bedic. And I realized that V stood for Vandross. And I also realized that being a diva meant speaking out about your diabetes and having more discussion, like I was saying, like instead of doing it by yourself. And I think this applies to anything, even my psoriasis, like owning, you know, being able to talk about it, uh, allowing yourself to be vulnerable and open up about that in order to ask for help is so important to anyone's kind of self-care routine especially now, even with mental health issues we're dealing with, for you to talk about the isolation and the loneliness and, and, to, and to be able to put some of those ideas on paper or out in discussion to see what your friends and family or seek professional help to deal with it. And so I created a t-shirt with the word divabetic and on the back of it, I put sugar's a bitch, not me. And so I began selling t-shirts to raise money for various diabetes organizations. And um, uh, I, would, I would go set up a table up in at the Apollo Theater. I would do outreach there. I'd 
I would just go all over the city with my table and selling t-shirts and hats with those uh, sayings on them. And people said, what else do you do? And I wasn't quite sure what they meant. And then I stumbled onto two women living with type one. And so I began doing um, support meetings for all types of divas and dudes. So instead of just saying we're doing type one or type two or pre-diabetes or a lot of diabetes, we're for everybody. And so just coincidentally, I had an idea to, um, to, I was doing a lot of programming, trying to get my foot in, trying to get my feel for how I could do this. I'm from theater. I'm not a doctor. I'm not a healthcare provider. People should know that. So I was just trying to think of like, how can I approach diabetes and get people's attention? And I, I really knew from my own experience that most people would do anything besides talk about diabetes. So I had to find an interesting way to do it. And I remembered being on the road with Luther and how he would have the background vocalists, including like Paulette McWilliams, uh, Lisa Fisher, Ava Cherry, Cindy Mizell, Brenda White King, Pat Lacey. There'd always be a makeup artist, uh, nails, they had glamorous clothes. And they seemed every time like they got out of the makeover chair, that they had a great attitude. And so I came up with this idea to combine makeover services with education and give away, have women and men be able to get free makeup, hair, mini massage, safe manicures, uh, just pampering services, image consultations. And then once they got those services, they could also meet one-on-one -on -one with an educator and, and talk about the issues that concern them more, most, because I thought that instant when you had the boost of confidence from experiencing a makeover service would be a great opportunity to, to talk about something in your care that you were concerned about or question. And I wanted to do that on a national level and travel back to the cities that I had toured with Luther as a thank you to the fans, because he changed my life and they changed my life. And that happened because they loved my boss and his music and played it. And so I just wanted to go back and, and urge all the fans who had diabetes or had family members with diabetes to do everything they could to prevent what happened to us and keep the music alive. So I was able to, um, for like four years, I toured nationally with Divabetic Makeover Your Diabetes. It's, it's all just so great what you're doing. And I love, um, <clears throat> excuse me, I love that you, you know, you mentioned you're not a doctor, but you took time and with your time with Luther and his um, medical situations that he went through, you know, you, you gained an education about diabetes and you figured out a way to help other people with the knowledge that you gained and to help, uh, you know, prevent complications from diabetes and just to educate other people. And that is how, um, you know, I really believe that's how change is made through, uh, you know, having people like yourself who you, you know, you had that close relationship with Luther and he was your boss and friend, but you, uh, you know, you took that experience and turned it into something positive uh, to help you know, countless other people. And I, I love your shirt and the saying on your shirt. That was really, that was really great. <laughs> yeah, no, you know, and I have to say like, you know, Luther is kind of the architect of what people consider the quiet storm musical format. And so many of those artists are gone. They're no longer with us. You know, it, it's affecting our community and, and the fans who listen to that music are disproportionately affected to it as well because someone specifically African-American men are much higher uh, statistically for, for potentially having a stroke, type 2 diabetes, and other complications from mismanaged diabetes. And so for me, it was like, wow, I want to go back to the people who gave me this incredible opportunity. I mean, when I met Luther Vandross, I was a fan, but I, and so I was so excited to go on that tour, but I was mesmerized by his incredible artistry. I mean, I remember walking into the darkened arena the first time we were in Minneapolis and it was, I just had arrived to start the Never Let Me Go tour. And I remember walking into the arena and on stage were Kevin Owens, Lisa Fisher and Ava Cherry. And they were going through the dance steps and the choreography. This is when the show was in the round 
um, if people don't remember. And the band led by Nat Ederly Jr. were playing along and, and I heard the voice and they were, and heard Luther singing and they were, everyone was doing their thing. And then all of a sudden I would hear a voice go, stop. Uh, I don't like that, like you, can you change the lights, blah, blah, blah. And then it would start up again, they'd start dancing, the music start playing, the voice would start singing, then I heard, stop, you missed a step there, Kevin or Lisa, let's take it back, start up again. And then the lights came on at some point, and I realized that the lighting director, the costume designer, the choreographer, the musical director, and the singer were the same person. I, I mean, I really thought it was a recording. I didn't even believe that was Luther Vandross singing at the same time doing all that stuff. And it was, and I just have to say, it still takes my breath away because it was so magical to have seen someone like that. And even in the worst moments of the dance with my father, the idea that that album went number one and that we were, I played a role in helping him achieve his ultimate dream, even, due to all that tragedy was incredible for me as well, just to see that things really do happen. And he was so hardworking, he was so ambitious. And so, you know, it's, I carry that legacy with me. And so I, I really did all the homework while I was trying to get my national tour ready that I wasn't gonna ride on his coach heels, that we were gonna have a strong enough program that could be received without any knowledge of Luther. And for years, I didn't really talk about my Luther connection because I didn't want someone to think, oh, that's just that. And so it's it's kind of fun to come full circle and be able to talk about what an incredible uh, man he was, what a great mentor, what a great boss. I mean, he was so generous and so funny and uh, what an incredible experience I had. And I, I just, Honestly, Arthur felt like everyone at that moment of the stroke who's heard about diabetes but doesn't pay it any mind. And that was a thing that just gutted me. And still, 20 years later, it will be 20 years next year that I started Divabetic and 20 years since he had the stroke. And, um, you know, it, it's still with me every day. Yeah, my my big thing is I'm I'm a huge music fan, and I of course for people that have listened to this podcast for my family and friends, they know I'm a huge Patti LaBelle fan, and um, so you know again I remember my mom listening to Luther when I was younger, and um, I became a fan of his and Patti LaBelle's, and so I I'm familiar with her story of you know being a diabetic as well, and. Um, you know, so I think that, as, as you said, using, um, not even using, but having the Luther connection, I'll say, and knowing, like you said, that the fans of his who are more uh, statistically likely to uh, develop diabetes and have complications from diabetes, and that you want to reach that community, and myself being an African-American man, um, and knowing the possibility of, um, you know, the higher statistic of developing diabetes. It really is uh, just so important, the work that you're doing to, um, to raise that awareness within the African-American community and just uh, his fans uh, nationwide and worldwide. <clears throat> well, we all have this natural curiosity about celebrities. And so, mm -hmm. like I said, you know, when they, when you hear your, you know, like Betty White died, you have a natural curiosity to know how she died. And obviously right. she had a long life. It's a little bit different. But even when you heard about Aaliyah or someone who dies much younger, and so not to really give the full story. And I understand privacy. I'm not, mm -hmm. I'm not negating the idea that someone should have their privacy. But I, I think when we're able to go a little bit more behind the music and, and learn these things. And it's a it's an opportunity to raise awareness and education. And so that's something that I strive to do uh, on our podcast that I host every month too, is just to talk about, uh, to play music by some of our favorite artists and, and talk about ideas or topics or health issues they've been dealing with that their music might inspire or their own personal life. And so, you know, you're gonna be on my podcast next week when we play music by Teddy Pendergrass, yes. because I really want to talk about how people who are challenged with disabilities or um, 
living with a disability, how they're challenged in the world and how they maintain a healthy attitude, especially during COVID, you know, or is it, you know, we know access isn't what it should be still and keep fighting for that every day. I was in the grocery store the other day and I couldn't believe how many things are on the higher shelves. I mean, how do you get the foods you want or even reach past the oranges to get to the apples if you can't, there's no way to do it. And I, it's just such an interesting conversation for people to get involved in uh, how, how many things in our lives are restricting people who have a complication or who have, you know, are dealing with a health issue that doesn't allow them to have full access on some of the things that most of us who are ambulatory could take for granted. And so I really want to get more involved with that because I feel that in the diabetes community specifically, we shun people with complications. Everyone will tell you that amputation, blindness, uh, even Alzheimer's now is becoming more of a topic, but kidney disease, it's a kidney stroke, kidney disease, amputation, blindness are huge complications that are pretty common and well known in the diabetes community. But how we bring those people back into the fold and allow them to come into our community without placing the shame and blame on them is a whole different conversation. And so I, I you know, because we do the more of the glitz factor and we're glamorous at Divabetic, I think we should be the front door of welcoming people in. And so you're gonna help me kick off this uh, year we're going to talk more about some of the people, some of the people who have are dealing with similar issues, who could kind of tell us what it's like, what that experience is about, and how we could all work together and be much more sympathetic, empathetic, and supportive. I was so I was so excited when you sent me an email to say that Teddy Pendergrass's music would be featured on the same episode that <laughs> I would be on. If you could, I don't know if you can see on the bookshelf behind me, but the very first book here on the bookshelf is Teddy Pendergrass's book, and uh, the one next to that is uh, is Christopher Reeves, and then it's the two Patty LaBelle books. <laughs> so it's um. Teddy Pendergrass, so I grew up listening to The Sound of Philadelphia Music. That's where I first heard about Patti LaBelle and Teddy Pendergrass. And um, I met Teddy Pendergrass one time at a, um, when LaBelle did their uh, reunion concert, I think it was back in like 2009 or something like that. And I, I'm a wheelchair user, so I was in my wheelchair and Teddy Pendergrass comes and sits right next to me. And he says, oh, hi, how are you? And I look and I said, I'm fine. And I said, oh my gosh. <laughs> and I said, wow. He looks at me and he says, there's no, I, there's no way you know who I am. I said, excuse me? <laughs> I said, I know exactly who you are. And oh my gosh, like, this is so great. It's so great to meet you. And he says, oh, nice to meet you too. So I, I got to tell him, how I became a fan of his music and uh, you're my latest, my greatest inspiration is one of my favorite all-time songs by anybody. It's just so well-written and uh, the music in that uh, song is uh, just one of my favorites. So again, I was very happy uh, when I saw your email that said Teddy Pendergrass's music would be featured uh, on the episode that I was going to be on next week on your podcast. <laughs> well, I, you know, after our conversations, I was so inspired by your passion and upbeat um, approach to life. And I thought it was so interesting that Teddy Pendergrass kept performing music even <laughs> after that crash he had where he was paralyzed. And I also was really um, inspired because he has made a point in interviews to talk uh, when he was alive to talk about that he didn't want to, he was more he wanted to use his celebrity to raise awareness for improving the conditions of people's lives who have spinal injuries or spinal health issues instead of just focusing on the cure. He wanted to, make, he wanted to help through education and um, other and awareness that, you know, to help people improve the quality of, of their life. That was really important to him. And so, you know, meeting you and hearing just how bright and happy you were, I just was like, wow, I really want to find an artist who kind of exudes that. And I just 
felt like he does. I, I feel like he does do it. And I did meet him once too. He came to um, he came to visit Luther in the hospital. It was very encouraging. And I mean, when we were in rehab, it was very encouraging and supportive during that time. It's always stayed with me, and I've always been a fan too. So it, it was all together in you know one big moment. But thank you, Arthur, because you really kind of made me go, oh, um, I think we should play Teddy Pendergrass. Yes, good. I love that. <laughs> and you so know, as I just have to say, like, the other thing I just wanted to take a pivot for a second mm -hmm. with Teddy Pendergrass and Luther Vandross is they were all about what you're saying about self-love, love, affection, and intimacy. And sometimes, you know, what I've discovered on my podcast now that we're going into our 12th year, uh, people want to hear about the topics that no one wants to talk about. And so one of the topics that we do talk about at Divabetic are intimacy issues related to diabetes, whether it's erectional, erectile dysfunction <coughs> or vaginal dryness or lack of desire or lack of sensation. Uh, we talk about those topics because my boss spent so much time talking about love and I think it does a disservice again, when people don't understand why certain things are happening in their body, and they might think it's age, they might think it's weight related, they might just think it's all the stress and anxiety of what's going on. And it's important to remember like how things connect in your body and that diabetes is one of those diseases that if, it, if you're not managing it, it can begin breaking down the capillaries, the smallest parts of your, the outside of your body, like all the tips of your fingers, your toes with the neuropathy, and then also your sex organs. So all those things start to get affected before it works its way into the heart and other major issues. And these are all opportunities for people to take the information and try to um, go to their doctor and seek help and, and try to deal with those issues, you know, deal with the issues that concern them the most. And the matters of the heart seem to be some of the biggest. And so we spend a lot of our time on our podcast and through our outreach talking about that as well. And as you said, all of that, it's so important. Um, <clears throat> you know, for me with this podcast, I started it um, a little over a year ago. Um, and as I mentioned in every opening of the podcast, I want to educate, raise awareness, and change the tone of conversation about disabilities. And as you just mentioned, for me, that also includes, like you said, intimacy issues uh, that people experience with disabilities and relationships that people have, uh, people that have disabilities. And at the same time, I also want to talk about, like you said, with the grocery stores <laughs> and how it's difficult for someone who's a wheelchair user or has some other mobility issue to reach things that are on higher shelves. And if nobody's around to help you, and sometimes you can have customers that are in the same aisle as you that will pass by and not say anything to you, uh, or, you know, do you need help? Can I get something for you? So I, uh, you know, I want to address all of those topics in, um, you know, in these podcast conversations. So that is uh, so important that you are addressing those as well uh, about diabetes related uh, issues uh, on your podcast and through the work that you're doing. I just saw when Luther was in his wheelchair, he was wheelchair bound after the stroke too. I saw that the world doesn't slow down for you. Mm -hmm. You're always trying to catch up and it's exhausting and it's relentless and it's also demoralizing. And that stuck, that went straight to my heart. And so, like I said, you know, when someone like with Luther, like so many people assign blame and shame to the weight gains and why that happened, or they assign shame and blame to me or anyone who was around him that we weren't taking better care of him. And I think sometimes they do that because they don't want to have the conversation themselves about it. But, you know, when you're on the other side of it, and there's nothing you could do at that point, <laughs> you have to kind of decide how vulnerable you're going to be about talking about it. I mean, I, I do think, you know, this, this idea about weight is always a problem and not showing enough people of all sizes living healthy, happy lives is wrong. And I, and, I, and I use my platform to talk about that too because of my experience through Luther because I just, I don't agree. I think if you're just going to shame and blame me, 
you're going to knock me down when I'm trying to get up. So that day when the pain, like we were saying at the beginning of, the, of this conversation, that day when the pain is too much and I don't feel I should do anything, if I'm feeling that shame and blame, that is not going to get me out of bed to go do the walk or do my Pilates or my stretches or whatever you do to get yourself going. And so I just want people to put that, you know, somehow you have to figure out what box you could fit it in. And maybe the box starts as a two guard garage and ultimately goes down to a jewelry box, but you have to put that in some place. And I, I just don't want to be part of that conversation anymore because I just think there's too much, there's too many people out there who are living well and healthy and how you manage your health is how you should manage it. How I manage my health is how I should manage it. It's not a one size fits all for all of us. Right. So that's very true. And it's, uh, again, you're addressing topics that need to be discussed. And that is um, starting that conversation and having those conversations is, um, you know, it's, it's very important. And I think that is, again, I think that's how we, start to see change in people and, uh, you know, and in society as a whole. And um, so I have uh, two more questions for you. The, the last real question I have for you is, since you are a podcast host, who would be your absolute dream guest to have on your podcast? Oh, Pat LaBelle. I mean, she, I, I did um, meet her and she accepted my first t-shirt and she does call herself a divabetic because of that so there you can google her on rachel ray i think it's on her website too mm -hmm. and different places where she's always called herself a divabetic because as soon as i came up with the first t-shirt uh luther's mom mary ida vandross and i went to philadelphia well she lived in philadelphia luther we went to see luther and I went to Philadelphia to visit his mom and Pella Bell showed up to see Luther and I gave her the first t-shirt and she said she was tremendously honored and gave me a hug. And so I don't know if she ever wore the t-shirt, but she has called herself a diabetic. And so I've always, always um, dreamed of having her on the podcast again, because I feel like you said, she's so motivational on so many levels and inspirational and because she was always so outspoken. I mean, the thing that I think is a real aha moment is when she admitted that she passed out on stage because of her blood sugars. And, you know, that's an issue for people to realize that sometimes it's just not about what you eat. It could be the adrenaline rush, the anxiety. Live performance is a workout too. It's physical, but there's so many things could, that could impact your blood sugar. So, I would love to have Pat LaBelle on our podcast. See, and we share that in common. I would love to have her on my podcast <laughs> as well. <laughs> well, we'll have, do, we'll have to do the same one. So who, so is she your first guest too? That you, are you your favorite? Your yeah, guest? she would She would be my all-time top guest, I think, uh, to have on my podcast for sure. <laughs> I have to think of someone else that we want to have on my podcast. We can, we can, we can make it happen. She'll, <laughs> she'll be on both of our podcasts. <laughs> We'll make it happen. <laughs> she you, is, you got me thinking, like, who would be my next one? But I'll, I'll have it by the end of this conversation. Yeah, I, um, I again, uh, through our, our great friend Tom, I had a chance to uh, meet Ali Stroker, who was the first uh, wheelchair user to win a Tony Award. And uh, she was my first guest of 2021. Uh, wow. for my podcast. So she, uh, she definitely was. And, uh, you know, she was on the top, uh, on that top list of people I would want on my podcast. So I've already had her uh, as a guest on my podcast. And uh, so now it's, it's uh, Patty LaBelle. <laughs> I'll let you have Patty LaBelle and I'll go to my second or third choice. <laughs> no, we can both, we can both have Patty LaBelle on our, on our podcast for sure. Definitely. <laughs> To wrap up this conversation, um, in addition to the podcast, can you share with our listeners uh, where they can find your podcast, how often you uh, put out episodes, and also anything else that you have coming up this year uh, with the Divabetic uh, nonprofit? Absolutely. So we're at divabetic.org. Our podcast is available on Blog Talk Radio as well as iTunes. And I'd see even like on the FM player, if you Google Diva Better Podcast, you could hear it for free anywhere. And we've got, I mean, I think I have like over 200 episodes in the vault. I also have a YouTube, Facebook pages, Instagram, and Twitter, either as Mr. Diva Better, which I'm known as, 
or as Diva Bedic, uh, that we're posting daily. I mean, I th the thing about the podcast, I have to say that's been so wonderful is every year we team up with another guest that I've actually had on my show. Uh, Best-selling author Tanya Kappas is a mystery writer. And so for a while I was doing um, a podcast series called Don't Let Diabetes Kill Romance, where we would partner a best-selling romance author with an educator to talk about intimacy, love, and relationship issues related to diabetes. And then I met Tanya, and since she was a mystery writer, she didn't really fit the format. So I had this very innocent idea like, oh, we should do a mystery show. So every year now for seven years, I write a mystery podcast. And I use all the people who work with me at Diva Bedic, our educators, our stylists, all come on and they play different characters. And we, um, we educate people to be detectives about their diabetes, which means like, you know, if you see something going on, say something, check out the, you know, put together some ideas, go back to the authorities, which are the, our healthcare providers and see if you can seek a solution. So look for the clues about why you might be having a high or low blood sugar and then follow up through, like a detective about how you could deal with it versus just denying it or getting too frustrated. And then this year, we are going to be publishing our first ebook at Divabetic on in intimacy issues with two well known authors in the field, Janice Rosler and Donna Rice. And we'll be talking specifically to men, women, <clears throat> and women, to same sex couples, uh, heterosexual couples. We'll be talking to couples who are wheelchair bound or dealing with disabilities. We'll have several editions of that book so that people could go to the one that applies to them and keep their house at home and learn how to keep love going in their lives too. So all that's coming up uh, right bef the year before our 20th anniversary, which is kind of exciting. Wow, that is, it's so very exciting. And, and that you've started 20 years ago is um, you know really amazing. And I'm again, very grateful uh, to have you on as a guest today and um, very excited for all of the great things and the great work that you are doing to raise awareness and educate uh, people about diabetes. You know, so thank you so much, Max, for uh, joining me today. I really appreciate your time. I look forward to working with you again. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for listening to this episode. Leave a review on Apple Podcasts and tell us what you liked about the episode. If you watch this episode on YouTube, thank you. And make sure you like the video, leave us a comment, and subscribe to our YouTube channel. Was there something in this conversation that you learned or something that made you laugh? Share this episode with a friend. Follow Divabetic on Facebook by searching for Divabetic and on Instagram at official underscore Divabetic. And also be sure that you're following us on all social media platforms at Our View for Life for more disability related content. That's O U R V I E W, the number four L I F E. Thank you for listening.